Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Robbins, and welcome to Life, Death, and the Space Between podcast. I'm a clinical psychologist and medium, and here we explore life, death, consciousness, and what it all means. Before we jump into our guest today, I just wanted to remind people that I am adding one show a month that is questions that you have for me. So if you have any questions you would like to ask me, please reach out to LDSB questions. So that's life, death, and the space between questions at gmail.com and send those over to me. And once a month, I'll go through them and answer a couple questions for one of our bonus shows that I typically air in addition to the four shows I air on Thursday on a Monday. So please reach out to me with any questions you might have. Today on the show, we have Vicki Roncero. Vicki is a certified, I'm going to say this wrong, Vicki, so maybe help me out, Osui Reiki, okay, Reiki master practitioner and instructor with a private practice in Upper Montclair, New Jersey. She uses Reiki to empower clients to use this energy in whatever way is helpful to them. Vicki was a writer and producer and worked in television for over 25 years. She has been a storyteller for as long as she can remember and believes Reiki is the ultimate storytelling tool. So welcome to the show today, Vicki. Thanks so much, Amy. It's so great to be here. Yeah, and I'm excited to learn about this because I feel like the term Reiki gets thrown around a lot, and mm-hmm. I don't feel like I even have a really good grasp on what exactly it is and how it works. Great. Well, Reiki, by definition, is two Japanese words, rei meaning light and ki meaning energy. So Reiki is light energy. And it was invented by Mikao Asui, a Japanese Buddhist monk who put together the Reiki system of natural healing using this light energy to help people move their own energy to work through trapped feelings and emotions so that their body could flow in optimal wellness and keep their physical health and mental health in optimal wellness. So how does it work exactly? Well, a Reiki practitioner is trained to tap into universal life force energy. So the same energy that connects every living thing, whether it be the energy that opens a rose or the energy that makes the waves in the ocean kind of come in and out. Reiki is connecting you with the living energy of the planet, basically. And when you connect with that kind of energy and you connect with yourself in that way and you start to connect with every inhale as an in and every exhale as an out and you start to really realize the energy that's inside of you at all times, it's very grounding, it's very calming, and it also just kind of makes you realize how your energy is something you can't control. Like it's it's really... Whether you like it or not, your fingernails are growing while you're sleeping and you're not, I think the biggest miracle is as a, as a mom, you can connect like when you're pregnant and you have a baby growing inside your body, like you're not controlling what's happening. It's like this miracle of life is happening inside of you and we don't really stop and question how, it's just kind of happening and when you're able to when life is getting kind of crazy and you're able to connect with your inner energy and calm yourself in this way and just kind of be connected to this energy that's always flowing, it's very grounding. So you're talking about both using it sort of personally, right? Like the average person can do this, but there's also like you are Reiki healers. Yes, because there's different levels like Reiki one. If someone's interested in learning self-care Reiki, they can take Reiki one and they can learn how to tap into this energy and use it for themselves to work through anxiety, work through stress, help them sleep better, those different types of things. But you can learn levels two and three and become all the way up to a Reiki master and learn how to help others tap into this energy and use this energy, you become a conduit to the energy and you're bringing it into the person you're working on to help them work through their trapped energy. So you're literally trained to pick up the areas in someone's body that are holding on to this trapped energy and to help it move, help push it through. So if someone comes in and they say, 
I have a pain in my left hip and I just, I've been to physical therapy and I've been to an orthopedic and I just really can't stand it anymore. Oftentimes you're working with them and you can literally feel the energy that's trapped in that area that's connected to an emotion. Maybe there's a trauma that they had that they thought that they worked through or they thought that they maybe met with a therapist and they talked about it and they felt like they came out the other side. But for some reason, that energy is still trapped in their body. Like in Reiki, we learned that Mm -hmm. every memory, every emotion from birth till now is trapped inside your body and your chakras, each one of your chakras is associated with a physical, emotional, or mental function that's connected with your physical body. Gotcha. Okay. And so so a Reiki master is someone who has experience or who is trained in all levels of this and can do healing on others. Yes. But someone like me could just take a class on Reiki and learn how to move stuck energy in my own body. Yes, you would learn a series of about 19 hand positions that would connect with your energy and your energy meridians and help you work through blocks. And so done repeatedly, if you make the commitment, you have to make the commitment to do them 21 days consecutively, you will start to see shifts in your energy as a result of creating these new pathways and helping the energy flow. So how would this differ from like acupuncture, which also can move stuck energy, right? Mm -hmm. Or um, tapping. Are Mm -hmm. you familiar with tapping? Yeah. Or emotionally focused therapy, people might call it. Like how how does Reiki differ or how is it similar to those modalities of treatment? Well, I think all energy healing is similar in that it's trying to move stuck energy. That's kind of the common denominator. Even like mind-body medicine, if if you're working with a trauma patient who's frozen, you are working with mind-body medicine just to connect them with their breath, to get them moving, and to become literally unfrozen. But Reiki is literally tapping into light energy. Like if you imagine that before there was light, there was darkness. If there was no light, there would, you know, things wouldn't be living. So Reiki is really connecting you with light energy and using light energy through visualization. And it's, it's connecting you with the light energy of like the light of the sunrise and the light of working with somebody who might be in a really dark place and allowing them to connect to the light inside themselves. And when you go into someone's energy field, what do you typically see and what are you looking for? And what does that look like for you? Like what's, can you take me through that process? When a, when a client typically comes in for a session in person, the first thing that I always do is scan their energy and take a look at where I am finding areas that might be blocked. And then I check in with their chakras and connecting with each one of the chakras and really kind of getting an idea of what their story is. For me personally, as you said, I worked in television and I did a lot of writing and I still do a lot of writing. And I feel like um, it's just so fascinating to me. When I first started learning Reiki, I was like, this is just crazy because you could literally be in somebody's chakra energy and just feel through the different levels of which ones are strong, which ones are weak, which ones need improvement you can piece together people's stories. Like if someone has a um, guarded heart chakra energy, it can literally feel like their heart energy has armor. And if you tap into that and you say, have you recently been hurt? Has there been something that's happened in a relationship that's keeping you feeling guarded? If you tap into someone's throat chakra and you feel like it's very stifled, there could possibly be something they're just not really speaking their truth about. They're not really owning their power and and living in their truth and speaking the truth of who they are. When you start to verbalize these things and work with people, it's amazing how it's like the energy never lies. So you're, you're putting together the pieces and the person is really profoundly moved by how connected their energy is to their story. So you're seeing like darkness in certain places, you're feeling it, you're 
you're feeling like it literally feels like it's not flowing like the rest of the body. Like I try to explain to people, if you imagine you go to a river on a beautiful day and you admire the way the river is flowing optimally and it looks beautiful, but then that night there's a storm and you go back the next day and you see little sticks and mud and muck is kind of getting in the way and the river is now flowing in a very erratic type of manner. This same happens with our energy depending on what we go through in our daily lives. One day might be particularly stressful and you could come in and your energy is completely different than it was the day before. Or a life transition could have happened, loss of a job, loss of a loved one, anything that's kind of created you to have a trapped energy within one of those chakras. Like, for example, the root chakra is connected to our sense of survival. If someone comes in and they've lost a job, almost always their root chakra is is completely blocked and they're feeling kind of like, who am I? What's, what's next for me? The rug has literally been pulled out from under them and their mm-hmm. root chakra, chakra needs opening. And so do you... F- do you see that as like darkness in that chakra? Do you feel that as like stuckness through yeah, your hands or do you? It feels like, like your hands begin to like buzz a little bit when you're, when you're gliding over an area of someone's body that has stuck energy. So you start to literally feel if you start at the head and you're scanning down, you can feel, okay, crown chakra feels good, throat chakra feels good. Then you might get to the heart chakra and you might start to pick up. What you pick up is either a little bit of heat, pulsing, or tingling in your palms of your hands. And when you're picking that up, you're connecting with something that needs to be healed and is stuck. And the person that you're working on also says, oh, why do I feel heat there? I'm feeling a little bit of heat where you're touching me. Or, oh, I feel tingles. And they might not even be aware of what the story is until you say, well, gee, you know, I'm, I'm picking up some heat in your throat chakra. Is there something lately that you haven't spoken up about? And, or is it something physical? Have you had a sore throat? Because it could be manifesting as either something metaphorical, something physical, something literal, kind of have to just work with what the energy is telling you and, and then confirm that with the client. So last week, I had the privilege of doing a distance healing with you. So when you did that with me, we couldn't have the back and forth banter. Mm -hmm. So how does that look different than an in person? Because I definitely felt like when we started, Mm -hmm. I felt like, I think I said chills Mm -hmm. were kind of coming, like I felt a sense of coolness in the air, a shift Mm -hmm. in that energy, and then tingling but we didn't have the back and forth for you to say to me, you know, what's going on here? What happened mm-hmm. there? So what are you doing in a distance healing that looks different? A distance healing is different in that it's much shorter and you're literally focusing on connecting with the person's energy. Everybody has, whether in person or over distance, we all have, and science is proving this more and more every day, we all have a biofield, our electromagnetic field of energy. And when you're doing a distance healing with someone, it's really fascinating because you're literally connecting with their energy in a similar way that we're connecting now over the phone. Like your, your frequency is connecting with their frequency and you are able to pick up their energy and you have to be really focused as the person transmitting the energy because you have to, you have to literally be able to kind of get yourself out of the picture, tune everything out and get out of your own way so that you're just completely lost in the person's energy and you're able to pick up anything that you might be feeling and you're sending and transmitting Reiki energy to every part of their body through some sort of um, something on your end that's physically representing them, whether you use a teddy bear or a bunch of crystals or whatever it is that you're physically using on your end to represent the person, you're sending this energy into their energy field and they're picking it up in the areas of their body that need it. So they might be feeling tingles or they might be feeling just overall relaxed or some relief in a hip or a knee or something that might have been bothering them. But you can just feel that you've connected 
and you know that the Reiki is reaching them. And oftentimes for me, the confirmation that I get is I have tapped into my intuition in a way that I connect with other energies and sometimes get signs that come through like names of people from other realms or sometimes I get pictures in my mind. And that to me, that's something fascinating that I love about Reiki distance healing because it's connecting with sort of in the way that you're a medium you're connecting with messages. You can't really explain how they're coming through, but they're coming through in the energy and you just trust that if all of a sudden a name is popping into your head, it's a message for the person and you need to tell them, while I was working on you, I heard this name or I saw this image. Does this mean something to you? And in that way, you're helping them put some sort of picture together. But the Reiki distance healing is really about just sending the overall healing and getting the client to feel the benefits of the healing that you're sending. And are you in a meditative state when you're doing this? Well, it's interesting because I used to have this idea of meditating as like, you know, sitting on a pillow, blocking everything out and just kind of being in this place of total stillness. And I was never very good at meditating in that respect. But when I found Reiki and had my first session, it instantly brought me into that place of stillness. I think for me, I needed to be guided by another person and to have that connection, the human connection that was happening in the Reiki session brought me to that place of stillness. And that's what got me so curious about learning Reiki because I wanted to be able to do that because I always had understood the benefits of meditation and I wanted to be able to get to that space but I had never been a very good meditator. And Reiki brings you into that stillness and completely connects you with your soul and reminds you that you're a soul with a body, not a body with a soul, because you start to literally, you, you feel different. You feel like life is, is just somehow shifted. You're, you're in like a higher consciousness. So when you're doing a distance healing, you don't really have to do that whole like meditative, sit on a pillow, get into this space. You really just have to know how to connect with the Reiki and you can instantly get into that space. It's really about just kind of tuning yourself off and tuning into the Reiki. And so when someone has a Reiki healing, what kinds of changes are they looking for? Because energy shifts can be so subtle. Mm -hmm. And I think for, for people, if you're not kind of tuned into subtle energies, it can be really difficult to feel any change. Mm -hmm. So how do you measure that? Like if you don't come in with like back pain that obviously you're like, right. oh, now it's gone, right? Yeah, yeah they like that. The obvious things, like obviously if someone's coming in, I have people who have, are going through chemo treatments and they're going through cancer or they have injuries that they're healing from. But more often than not, it's something emotional. Like someone's gone through a breakup and they're just really feeling like, why is it that I keep going for this same kind of guy who hurts me this way? I want to break this cycle. And it might be somebody who's just got fired from a job and they want to make sure that the next job that they get is really something that's feeding their soul. They want to feel like, you know, life is short. And in this next round, I want to make sure that I'm doing something I really love. And to me, it's really fascinating that more and more people are coming for Reiki to just really connect with themselves, to really kind of have that soul connection and to really listen to that voice that's telling them what their soul really wants. And um, that's not always easy. Like we're programmed in certain ways to think we have to have a job, we have to do this, this is who we're meant to be. And then when that changes, when suddenly, like in, in my case, I had been laid off from a job that I loved and found myself in a, in a Reiki session and stepped out feeling like none of this really matters. Like I, I went in feeling like my life was over. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I was Vicky from Nickelodeon and I loved my job. And suddenly I just felt like, wait a minute, there's many jobs I could have and the whole life to be lived. And so the shifts like that, like, yes, it's not a physical shift. Like, oh my gosh, my leg feels better. But it's more of an awakening. It's more of tapping into something much bigger, realizing that life is meant to be lived in a state of joy and that if you're not feeling that, those little shifts that lead to bigger shifts are about your happiness and getting mm -hmm. to a place where you really feel like life is is happy and you're really enjoying it. Well, and I think what I want 
kind of people to take away with. And part of why I expose people to all different types of healing modalities is because what works for one person might not work for someone else. So I'm thinking about in talk therapy, sometimes we get to a point where it just feels like, okay, I've talked and talked and talked and talked about this and I'm still not moving, right? Things still aren't shifting for me. And so I think sometimes it's helpful to think about, okay, why are things maybe not shifting? And what other ways might we be able to look at this issue to move things? And if that is, I mean, maybe that's a different type of therapy, but maybe that's, you know, Reiki or tapping or mm-hmm. EMDR. There's there's so much out there for people to explore that it doesn't. And this is where for me as a therapist, I've sort of loosened my grip significantly since I started you know, my practice is that mm-hmm. there can be so many ways for people to heal. And it really doesn't matter what mm-hmm. modality you use. Exactly. As long as you're healing. Exactly. And that was the big theme. I just recently went to the Integrative Healthcare Symposium in New York City. I know. Where I kind were... of had, je- I, I was pretty jealous of watching, <laughs> envi- envious, I should say, watching your yeah, Instagram it, posts on that. It was truly amazing because there were some of the finest top doctors from all over the world. And they were talking about how they're starting to really tap into ancient healing techniques and ancient wisdom. And they're really seeing clients who are coming in. And as clinicians, they're seeing them every few months and they're giving them medication and they're, they're seeing some issues that are just not going away. And it's about kind of digging deeper and getting to the why. Like, why is this happening? Not just, hey, this is what's happening. Here's the pill to fix this. It's more about let's let's really dig deeper and figure out, you know, why this is happening and, and what you can possibly do maybe spiritually or, or from a different, a deeper place to kind of get out of this pattern. So that's been fascinating. Yeah, and, and I think really, in my mind, the magic is, is where East meets West. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because when you can integrate both, like the best of all of these healing modalities, Mm -hmm. what would be better than than that? Sure. I totally agree. And I'm actually, my father was an orthopedic surgeon. And so I was raised my whole life with a father who was a surgeon and a lot of his friends were doctors. And I have every respect for needing a doctor. I mean, just now I broke my ankle two weeks ago and had to go to the emergency room and have an orthopedic take a look at my leg. So obviously, like I I think that each has its place. And when they work together, it can just really be phenomenal. What's interesting is the experience I had actually when my dad was passing here, he was, he had been a surgeon for his whole life and he was actually dying in the ICU at the hospital where he had been the chief of orthopedics for over 30 years. And every doctor is like, you know, dancing around with the utmost respect for him, trying to do everything they can to help him. And I was there doing Reiki around the clock and literally what he needed in those final days was the spiritual peace and the emotional support of Reiki. And I just, I really felt like, you know, they were really working tirelessly and doing all they could. And at one point his pulse rate was very high because he had COPD and he would get anxious when he couldn't breathe. And um, the nurse came in and said, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, the bell just went off. Let me get you something for that anxiety. And I Mm. came in and I just started to do Reiki and we literally saw the numbers drop down 20 points. And she came in with the medication and said, had another nurse been in here? Did someone give you something? And he said, no, my daughter just did Reiki. It was really validating Mm. because there you were with like, you know, the numbers don't lie and the nurses are seeing that they went to get medication. And in the meantime, the anxiety was brought down with some natural technique that really worked to bring down his anxiety in a significant way. So when more and more people open to these ideas and it's exciting to think that that's kind of starting to happen in a bigger way lately. Um, I really do think that the two could work hand in hand. And how can Reiki be used for healing someone who's transitioning? Well, I think that it's it's hugely useful. Like I've actually also taken a three-day death doula class because I think there's a big link between Reiki and helping people transition. Because if you think of the chakra points, like our seven chakras, 
the bottom three chakras are your connection to the earth and your top three chakras are your connection to spirit. And the middle chakra is your heart. So basically you have a strong connection to your human self and a strong connection to your, your energy of your soul. And when you're actually working with someone who's transitioning, you can literally feel the strength of the bottom three chakras starting to diminish and the strength of the top three getting stronger. And you just kind of know that the person is, I mean, it was really kind of crazy that I was able to tell when my dad was going to pass. I I stayed with him for six days and nights and I didn't leave the ICU, but I was sending my mom and brother in and out and they were going home to sleep and... I felt like in those days, I was literally having like a shared death experience with him. It was more Mm -hmm. about like a soul connection kind of thing. And I didn't really expect anyone to understand that because it was hard to explain it. I kind of knew like exactly when he was going to pass. And I was able to say to my mom and my brother, you guys need to sleep here tonight. We're all going to sleep here together. And we were able to all like hold hands and be there with him and It really felt like, to me, I felt in that moment, like, wow, this might exactly be why I got into Reiki in the first place, because Mm. it was so, it was like a beautiful thing to be able to give to him, to be able to help him calm him and, and ease him into that space where the fear was diminishing and he was kind of surrendering to this place that actually felt less scary. You know, I know that um, being a surgeon himself, a lot of times doctors feel like when they get to that place where they can't do anything else, it's almost seen as a failure. And it's like a lot of like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But literally with Reiki and any kind of like grounding um, techniques that connect you with mindfulness, you start to really think of like everything in life has its cycle. And as sad as it is, we all have a limited number of breaths and your energy doesn't die, your physical form dies. And to kind of see death as the opposite of birth and that they both have a place in the cycle of your life is a much more beautiful way than to think like, oh, he's gone, he's dead, I'm so sorry, it's over. And I really felt that, I really felt as my dad was passing, I actually felt energies coming into the room that were around him and surrounding him. and. It, it was overwhelming. Like I just, I felt really like the, the energy in the room was just so powerful. And I had no question that he was being supported by energies and that he was going to a, a beautiful place. And it really helped me with processing my grief that followed when I connected back to my human self and the fact that I had just lost my dad and that I was a daughter who was grieving. So it was really powerful. Yeah, it sounds so beautiful. And what's amazing to me, and I'm curious about the heart chakra, because you didn't mention that one, Mm -hmm. when someone transitions, but I I have heard that before, that the the kind of the three grounding chakras that are most rooted in sort of earthly life Mm -hmm. start to fade. Mm -hmm. But what happens to the heart chakra? Well, that that's where you kind of center your your focus in Reiki, like you just kind of keep sending energy to the heart chakra, because it's really, that's the most powerful, like I feel like whether it's your human self, or your your spirit self, like your, your love is really the biggest connection. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the area that you're trying to send the most love and light to and that you're trying to use that energy to go to reach all the way up to the crown chakra and to just feel connected. So that when you, you feel strength in that chakra through the whole process until obviously the end when the heart's no longer working. And that's kind of the physical sign that, you know, this person has truly passed, which is when you know that the physical form has ended. Do you still feel the the strength of the chakra for the love, right? Because I think that that's, that's the soul part that goes on, mm-hmm. right, is the love. Yeah. But I just, I feel like you're, you're very much then connected to the upper chakras. Like you're really feeling the person is, is, is leaving their body and you can feel what was, what was crazy was in those moments, I, I even felt like the room physically transformed. Like I stepped out for a moment because the nurse asked for a minute to just kind of turn my dad and have like some time with him. And I, when I came back in, I was like, 
why did they change his room? Why did they move him to another room? And people were, were like, what are you talking about? And it, it felt like the colors and the light, like I felt like he was in this sacred space of transitioning and even the floor to me felt like earth and like the room felt dark and comforting. And all of a sudden I walked back in and I felt this sterile, very bright room. And I knew that his soul had left and it was, it was really crazy. His body was still kind of being, his chest was moving up and down because of a machine, but I knew that his actual soul had left already. And it was really powerful moment. And it was actually on your podcast that I heard a doctor talking about shared death experiences. And I was Mm -hmm. like, Oh my gosh, I can totally relate to that. That sounds Mm -hmm. exactly like what I went through. And yeah, it's, it's just really amazing when you hear more people talk about things like that and share their experiencing is, you know, once again, it's like the storytelling, everybody, somebody's story could really help you understand your own. And it's really powerful. Well, and what a beautiful way to help him transition. Yeah, that was, it, it really felt like a strong, like it was a, a definitely like I was guiding him and helping him. And when I was feeling energies coming into the room, I just, I really was overwhelmed. Like I just felt like, wow, this is, I'm not really here. It's like energies passing through me. And in Reiki, when we were talking before about the different levels in Reiki one, you're learning hand positions and you're learning basically how to do Reiki and you're learning about Reiki and then later you're learning how to teach Reiki to other people and how to do Reiki on other people but ultimately as a Reiki master you're learning how to be Reiki like you're you're a conduit for the light to pass through you and when my teacher would explain that I'd kind of be like okay I I guess I know what she means and in in those days in the room with him I was like whoa I get what she means like I'm I'm here and I'm just holding space for whatever's needed to pass through me. It wasn't really about, you know, I never even stopped to think, am I hungry? Did I change my clothes? Did I brush my teeth? It was, I was a soul that was like holding space in the room for his soul's journey. And it was, it was a really powerful thing to experience. So one last question before we end, I'm adding a new question to my interviews. In your opinion, Mm -hmm. And after doing this work, particularly with people who have transitioned, but also with people in general, what do you feel like matters most in the end? I definitely feel like the love matters the most because that's what keeps the person alive, literally, because it's, it's, you know, it's interesting to see that suddenly all of your titles are being stripped away and all, not, none of that matters, like who you were. It's just, you are this light that's passing to another energetic realm and, the what remains in the people that you leave behind is what keeps you alive and what everyone remembers is how you touch them how you moved through their life how you made a difference for them and nobody's really thinking about anything but that to me that's the energy of love and that's what kind of unites all of us on this journey and that to me is for sure the answer this was beautiful today if vicky if people want to find you where can they where can they do that Sure. I have a website. It's um, ronceroreiki.com, R-O-N-C-E-R-O, and then R-E-I-K-I.com. And I'm also on Instagram, at ronceroreiki. And yes, anybody who's listening, if you're interested in trying a distance session, I would be happy to give you 20% off if you mention Amy's show. Thank you. But thank you. This was great. I love your show. Thank you. I loved having you on. I know we've gone back and forth for a while, so I'm glad we were finally able to to make it happen and to, you know, bring kind of more awareness to another mode of healing. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks, Vicki. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Like what you heard today and want to hear more? Curious about what comes next and what it all means? You can subscribe on iTunes. Just go to podcasts and find life, death, and the space between and hit subscribe. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dr. Amy Robbins. Ask me any questions you might have. Let me know what else you'd love to hear about or just share your story. I can't wait to hear from you.